we're going to have a discussion today about uh, the elections in Venezuela, which took place a couple of weeks ago with four people who were there during the elections as observers and as um, election observers uh, and also as journalists and can give you a little bit of a, um, insight into what happened because it's hard to get that from the US press. The United States um, uh, opposed these elections. Uh, they asked for a boycott of them. Um, their man in Venezuela, Guaido, uh, did boycott, but other opposition parties uh, uh, did take part in the elections. Um, they've uh, been speaking out against the elections in, in various forms around the world to try to undercut them. And we know regardless before the, the elections even happened that uh, the US was uh, speaking against the elections that took place. Uh, the fact that they happened, they happened at this time, they happened under the, uh, this period of COVID, which has hit um, everybody very hard, including Venezuela, and especially under these sanctions, uh, is a victory and a blow to imperialism. Um, and uh, um, the United States has, uh, um, has no right to talk about anybody's democracy. It is perhaps one of the worst democracies um, in the world, the worst election systems. Two times in recent history, the people voted one way and other people were brought into power. Um, that was Bush and Trump. We have a registration in this country of about 57% of the eligible um, uh, voters of people of, of voting age. It's 95% in Venezuela. Uh, money is very important in US national elections. You either are rich or supported by the rich. There are two parties in the United States. There were 107 in these elections in Venezuela. So you're gonna hear more about what happened down there and we're gonna start off with Margaret uh, Flowers. Margaret is director of Popular Resistance. She's a medical doctor and has been a leader in the movement for single payer Medicare for all health systems system. She's a leader of the Sanctions Kill Coalition. There's a lot more you could say about Margaret. And she's also a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee. So Margaret, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you to UNAC for organizing this important event. And I really appreciate all of you who took time tonight to be here with us. So I was in Venezuela as an official election observer. That means I was invited as well as Vijay Prashad uh, by the National Electoral Council. And uh, because we were the official international observers, we were able to receive training on how the whole process is, how the machines are put together, the security protocols that they have. And we actually got to test out the process ourselves, and, you know, learn about it firsthand. So first off, what I want to say is, you know, as Joe said, uh, you can't really trust what you're hearing in the media, in the corporate media in the United States or in other Western imperialist countries about Venezuela in general, but particularly about the uh, elections that happened, you know, the, the elections went very smoothly. They have an excellent process down there. And despite the US's attempts to interfere in the election, it went pretty well. Um, just to give a little bit of recent background, as Joe mentioned, Juan Guaido, who was previously in, in January of 2019, he was elected as the leader of the National Assembly. Uh, he's part of the Popular Will Party or Voluntad Popular. And uh, at that time, the National Assembly was actually what was considered to be defunct. It was in contempt of the Supreme Court because there were a number of people who had, were elected to the National Assembly and afterwards it was discovered that they had tried to buy votes or had bought votes and they were supposed to redo their races, but they refused to do that. So, so Juan Guaido becomes the president of this defunct National Assembly and the United States recognizes him as president of Venezuela. But despite that and the multiple coup attempts that the US tried with Juan Guaido following that January of 2019, it didn't work. And the, that extreme right wing opposition represented by Juan Guaido isolated itself more and more. So I think one of the things that was really important about this election is that other right wing parties 
they're referred to as the opposition, uh, despite the US pushing for them to boycott the election and to say it was not legitimate, they felt very strongly that they wanted to participate in this election, that they wanted to have their voice heard through the democratic process and separate themselves from Juan Guaido, who they said, and, and we met with some of them, they said would only, only exist in power in power. He doesn't actually have any power, but you know, only is exists because of the United States. They said his base is in Washington, DC, not in Venezuela. So that's really important because over the last few months, uh, those leaders of these opposition parties have been meeting with the Maduro administration and negotiating how this election was going to come about. By their constitution, they needed to have a national assembly election this December. And so working with you know, nego these negotiations, they were able to work out a process that everybody felt comfortable with. And that included choosing new leaders of the National Electoral Council. So they, they chose five new people to, to lead that. And it's a separate body of government. Venezuela has five parts of their government and the National Electoral Council is one of them that is independent. So um, another thing that happened this year is that there was a major fire in the warehouse that houses most of the electoral machines. And they still don't know how that fire came about. Uh, but despite that, Venezuela was able to put together new machines, new software that was, you know, Venezuelan made software and developed a very secure system. And in fact, when we talked to voters after they finished the process as they were coming out, they said they loved the new machines, they were much faster, it was much easier. So, um, and I understand that Venezuela had been intending to replace the machines anyway. So they overcame that hurdle despite the economic war. So that was important. Um, there are, as Joe said, 107 political parties. It's, they have much lower barriers to participation in Venezuela than we do in the United States. And I believe 95 or so of those political parties were not aligned with the Maduro administration, the, the um, United Socialist Party of Venezuela, the PSUV. So 95 or so of those parties were considered opposition parties. They had 14,000 candidates and they had 277 seats in the National Assembly that they were voting for. Um, Venezuela uses both a direct election of deputies and they use a proportional representation system. So in this election, voters were only voting for a deputy and a political party. So it was very simple, it was very quick. Um, there was no violence that was reported or that we witnessed at any of the polling centers. They had a really excellent biosecurity protocol as they called it. And so they had people lining up so that they were physically distanced. There were individual rooms that voters would go to and voters were assigned to different rooms so they could come and look on the wall and see which room they were supposed to go to. And then they went into that room one at a time. And the system is both a, an electronic system and a paper ballot system. So the voters would go in, show their ID, and this is not an issue in Venezuela. Everybody has a national ID there. The, polling person would put their number into the machine, the voter would put their thumb on this digital scanner and it would uh, show that they were indeed you know, who they said they were. That would activate the voting machine. They would then go around to a private section where the voting machine was, cast their vote. And then when they hit submit, it would put out a piece of paper receipt so they could look at that and make sure that what was on that receipt was consistent with what they voted. Then they would fold that up put it into a box next to that machine, and then go to another table where they would physically sign out and do an ink thumbprint next to their name to show that they completed the process. So it's a very, you know, kind of very secure process. And people said they felt very comfortable with it and, and that it felt like it was very secure and, and that the overall system was very good. And then at the end of the day, they do an audit of about a little over half of the machines at each polling center. This is public, anybody can attend it. Also during the day, political parties are allowed to have representatives sitting in the rooms, watching the process to make sure that they feel comfortable, you know, that everything's going very smoothly. There's no influence. They don't have people outside of the polling centers with signs or literature or anything like that. Uh, just people line up and then they go in 
can they vote? So they do this audit that's public at the end of the day. Uh, they count each of the paper ballots. They sh you know, show them, count them, make sure it matches with the machine count. And if more than half of the machines are, you know, that it's compatible, the, the paper count and the machine count, then they certify that polling center. If there's any kind of discrepancy, they do a hand count of all of the machines at that voting center. So um, something that we would love to have that level of transparency and accountability in the United States, but they have it there. And so at the end of the night, or actually the early morning when they announced the results, um, those results were accepted. None of the political parties you know, said, this is fraudulent or this is foul or anything like that. It just they everybody seemed to feel really good about it. So that's very different from what you hear, you know, in the United States. Um, so as I said, you know, uh, the opposition, I just want to talk a little bit about Guaido because now, you know, the, the US has recognized him as the president of Venezuela, a number of other Western imperialist and US allies in Latin American, you know, countries have also recognized him, but he, has even less legitimacy. He's not in the National Assembly. Uh, he doesn't have a base of support in Venezuela. This is very different from what you'll hear in the in the US media. So what happens now, you know, with him? And it's interesting that um, some of the opposition folks, uh, one of the opposition leaders, Henri Falcone, uh, basically came out against the US boycott of the election. Another opposition leader, Enrique Capriles, uh, is basically saying to the US, you know, you don't stop recognizing Juan Guaido. He's not the president of this country. And Guaido has been asking to meet with president, incoming President Biden. And apparently, you know, the reports are that so far they're not meeting with him. So this would be really an excellent thing if the Biden administration would recognize the democratically elected constitutional president of Venezuela, which is Nicolas Maduro. And, um, and we're, you know, throughout this whole ordeal of the US, you know, trying to put this fake president in charge, the Maduro administration has been saying to the US, we'd like to meet with you. They, they offered to meet with President Trump numerous times. Trump would never meet with the Maduro government. But I do understand that the foreign minister, Jorge Ariaza, met with Mike Pompeo, um, you know, during over the last years. So now Biden is, the Biden administration incoming is saying that they are open to meeting with the Maduro government. Um, the Trump administration said they would only meet with Maduro if he agreed to step down and hold a new election. Uh, what I'm hearing from the, from the incoming Biden administration is that they would like to see a new election, but it doesn't sound like that's a requirement for meeting with the Maduro administration. Um, when Maduro was elected in 2018, it was similarly, an excellent process. It went smoothly. Um, my partner, Kevin Zies, um, some of you may know he, he died recently, but he was there in May of 2018 for that election and reported you know, that it went very smoothly and, and Maduro won a large majority of the of votes in that election. I think it was like close to 70% of the votes. So, um, so he is the constitutional and democratically elected president of Venezuela. And um, the other thing that you may hear from the Biden administration is they're saying, oh, well, there's this serious crisis in Venezuela. And there is a serious crisis in Venezuela. The US economic war has caused many problems you know, for them in terms of being able to get access to food and medicines and fuel and things like that. Um, and so you're, the Biden administration is saying, oh, well, so we have to, you know, he, Maduro's got to allow us to give humanitarian aid. But what we need to understand in the United States is that if the US government is seriously concerned about the crises in Venezuela, the very first thing that the US needs to do is to stop the illegal economic war that it's waging against Venezuela. And, um, and so I'm going to stop there. And I think BJ is going to talk next. Thank you, Margaret. Um... Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in Margaret's um, introduction was that uh, she and Kevin Zies and uh, two others um, were, and many others were part of the Embassy Protection Collective, which um, occupied uh, the uh, Venezuelan embassy in Washington, DC and stayed there to the very end um, uh, under harassment from right-wingers that were outside. There was also a lot of supporters outside. Um, they did go to court 
and they were given a probation sentence for doing uh, that, um, which their probation has now um, ended. And it was a, a tremendous thing for our entire movement, uh, what happened there. Um, our next uh, speaker is Vijay Prashad, who's a historian, editor, and journalist. He's the director of Tricontinental Institute for our Social Research. He's written more than 20 books and um, many, many articles. Uh, his analysis of events has been a very important um, mainstay for many of us in the left and progressive movements in the United States. So here's Vijay. Uh, thanks a lot, Joe. It's really great to be here with UNAC, um, building the anti-war uh, forces within the United States, I think counts as one of the most important tasks of our time. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here with you with my friends, uh, Margaret, Bahman, and Zoe. Uh, I'd like to just say, give a plug that every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Zoe and I are part of a, um, a world news program called Give the People What They Want, which is on People's Dispatch Facebook page. So please come and join us there. Um, Margaret gave you an excellent overview of the election process of what this election was like. Uh, yes, all four of us were in Venezuela. Margaret and I were official observers on behalf of the CNE. I want to provide just uh, perhaps two points uh, for consideration. The first is a sense of this election in terms of the objectives of the United States government. And secondly, what the Biden administration uh, is perhaps going to do regarding Venezuela and what I think sensitive, good, well-meaning people, people affiliated with UNAC, perhaps UNAC itself, and those of you who've taken the time to join us on Sunday, uh, what you might want to do to put pressure on the Biden administration. So that's basically what I'm going to, to cover. Firstly, in terms of the politics of this election, as Margaret said, um, you know, Look, uh, we went and saw the election. We didn't see any fraud, but actually don't take my word for it. Margaret and I were at a meeting with opposition politicians who participated in the election. Now, what was really significant in that meeting was that there were leaders of two political parties, Acción Democrática and COPE, which had governed Venezuela between the two of them from 1959 to 1999, which means from basically a 40 year period, which was ended by the Bolivarian revolution. The leaders of these two political parties were in the room with us. And the leaders of these parties said, there is no fraud, that there are the normal irregularities in, a, in any kind of election. Plus there's the advantage of incumbency, uh, which the, um, uh, the party of president, uh, Nicolas Maduro, uh, you know, is able to enjoy. That's the problem with the way democracy is set up. But they said there is no fraud. Uh, Bruno Gallo, who is the leader of a liberal political party, uh, he openly said, he said, I spent 10 years trying to find fraud in the National Electoral Commission, couldn't find it. These are Venezuelan politicians who oppose the government of Nicolas Maduro and who fought the election and who despise what Juan Guaido is doing to the politics of their country. You see, the question for them is they would like to assert the sovereignty of Venezuela's political process. That's really what they are interested in. And in fact, in that uh, question, both the government of Mr. Maduro, you know, the entirety of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and the right-wing parties, including the evangelical parties, all of them are in agreement that what they would like to establish is the sovereignty of Venezuela's political process. What the United States government has done against the 1945 Charter of the United Nations from the election, the legitimate democratic election of Hugo Chavez in 1998, from the 1998 election onward, the United States has interfered in Venezuela's political process and has tried to subordinate its politics to destroy its political process. Please understand that this is not a thing that started with the Trump administration. It didn't start with the Obama administration. 
This goes back to 1999. This is a very long period, right through the time when uh, Hugo Chavez was the president of, of, of Venezuela. Till now, the United States government has tried to disrupt the political process and the political sovereignty of Venezuela. 14,000 candidates ran in this election. As Margaret said, out of the 107 political parties that ran in this election, 98 of them were opposition parties. You know, this is something to breathe in. When they say there's fraud, if there's fraud, why is it so many parties running and none of them complained about fraud? They created a political system which is proportionate representation, which partly is about direct uh, election of candidates and partly a list system, which is why there's a mismatch between the percentage of votes earned and the number of seats that will come and be taken in the National Assembly. On the 5th of January, the new National Assembly will sit as per the Constitution of Venezuela. Um, this is very important. They are going to take their seats 15 days before Joe Biden is inaugurated. And they very much hope, and it's not just the government of Nicolas Maduro, it's not just the Socialist Party, the PSUV, it's not just the Communist Party and others on the left, but also parties on the right. They very much hope that this National Assembly will be able to assert a project for the Venezuelan people. This is something interesting. You see, they would like to see uh, the National Assembly take some leadership in providing um, a platform for Venezuela to deal with the pandemic. Currently, it's only the executive branch led by Nicolas Maduro, which has really worked extraordinarily hard to contain the, uh, the pandemic. There's been no help from the National Assembly, which was elected in 2015 and which was won by the opposition. That National Assembly, because of the subordination of Venezuelan politics, at least this section of the politics to the aims of the United States government, which was to delegitimize Venezuela entirely. Because of that, the National Assembly was not actually putting the nation ahead of its interests from Washington, DC. It was not assisting the executive in dealing with the pandemic. So when I spoke to people in the government of Venezuela, they said they welcome a National Assembly. This is before the election result. They welcome the National Assembly, whoever wins, they would like to have a partner in the legislative branch to assist them in driving a policy agenda forward, which is going to help Venezuela tackle this pandemic. And of course, help Venezuela tackle the much more grave issue, which is the sanctions regime. And I'm going to come to that um, in a second. Now, it's important for us to uh, understand that the National Assembly will take its seat on the 5th of January, 15 days before President Joe Biden will be inaugurated on the 20th of January. You will notice that the day of the um, election result, well, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Is the US election even decided yet, Joe? I'm not sure. Uh, it's a fiasco. Um, it is an utter fiasco. But at some point after the election, President Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela congratulated um, Joe Biden and said that I would like to have a dialogue with you because this long period of attempted regime change, including the attempted assassination of Nicolas Maduro, he said, it's not something that we should use as a foundation for our conversation. Let's talk with a tabula rasa, with a clean slate. Let's open a dialogue. That's what Nicolas Maduro said. And let me just say something um, you know, toward the integrity of President Maduro. Joe Biden, during the campaign, called President Maduro a thug. He called President Maduro a thug. Now, thug is a particular word. It comes from my language, which is Hindi. It is borrowed into English. It is a racist term. Mr. Joe Biden, as a candidate for the United States presidency, used a racist term to refer to a person who's a head of government in the Americas. That's an outrageous thing. But Mr. Maduro, after the election, didn't bring that up. He just said, let's, with a clean slate, have a conversation. A few days ago, maybe a week ago, Bloomberg wrote a story which was based on three anonymous conversations with people close to the Biden administration that's coming in. And these three people informed Bloomberg that, yes, they would like to hold a dialogue with Nicolas Maduro. And they said, we would like to see new elections. But as Margaret pointed out, they also said, it's not necessarily a precondition. Mark their words, not necessarily a precondition. It could be a precondition. 
But nonetheless, they have departed slightly from the Trump position of elections, new elections, or the departure of Nicolas Maduro as a precondition for a reset in US-Venezuela relations. So there seems something interesting there, but I want to caution you, comrades and friends. I want to caution you. The National Security Advisor coming in to the Biden administration is Jake Sullivan. And last year in March 2019, Jake Sullivan had a long conversation with Walter Russell Mead at the Hudson Institute. And I would really recommend you go back and listen or watch uh, Jake Sullivan have this conversation with Walter Russell Mead. It's a very instructive conversation. When they get to Venezuela, um, uh, Jake Sullivan says something quite interesting. He first admits that a military solution is unlikely. Um, and I would like just to quote him. He says that um, a military solution driven by the United States is too big a risk to entertain. On the other hand, he says, we have to focus on all the non-military tools. This is what we call a hybrid war. And then he says something which to me is extraordinarily dangerous. He says, the Biden, if Biden comes in, the Biden administration must double down on the sanctions and continue to build the international coalition around this. Double down on the sanctions. I, I would like to say something very specific about that. The sanctions policy prosecuted by the United States government is a murderous policy. A few days ago, the Progressive International released a statement, a statement condemning the unilateral criminal sanctions that the United States currently has against not only Venezuela, not only Iran, but almost 32 countries around the world face unilateral and criminal sanctions. They are criminal because they don't have the uh, imprimatur of the United Nations Charter, United Nations Security Council vote on the basis of Article 6 in the Charter. They don't have a vote. So they are illegal because, in fact, any sanctions must come with some UN imprimatur. Progressive International came out and quite fundamentally said that this is an outrageous uh, set of policies the US government is prosecuting against countries in the world. In Venezuela, during the pandemic, it has been catastrophic. The election is important. Um, the new National Assembly sitting is important. But your task as people in the United States has got to be to raise hell about this sanctions policy, not only against Venezuela, but Iran, against Zimbabwe, against Syria, against the range of countries. It is very important to put pressure on the more liberal elements in the Congress, people like Cory uh, Corey Bush, um, you know, uh, AOC, um, Chris Murphy even, who's idiosyncratic sometimes, pressure must be put on these people to make public statements against the continuation of the sanctions policy. It's not enough for Mr. Biden to say that he'll meet Mr. Maduro at some point. The sanctions have to end. If the sanctions don't end, these cruel, terrible sanctions, in time, the United States is going to be judged not only as one of the worst powers in the world in our time, but a cruel, horrible power that has allowed millions of people to suffer in order for the ends of the US government sitting in Washington. So please, friends, many of you are sensitive people involved in your communities. It is extraordinarily important for you to lift up the issue of sanctions. You might want to get involved with um, the Sanctions Kill Coalition or in your own communities in your own way. Please put pressure on people who are representatives in the US Congress to take a position pressuring the Biden administration against the sanctions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vijay. Vijay mentioned the Sanctions Kill Coalition. This is a coalition which UNAC helped found. Um, a number of people um, on the webinar tonight are members of the Sanctions Kill Coalition. We work against these unilateral sanctions that have been strangling countries um, around the world. You can find us at sanctionskill.com.org on the, um, for a web page, and there's also a Sanctions Kill uh, Facebook page. So next I'm gonna introduce Zoe PC, who's a journalist with People's Dispatch. She was also in Venezuela for the elections. And um, before that, she was in Bolivia for their elections, which was another huge blow to US imperialism and another um, victory for the uh, people of, of, of Bolivia. So I'll turn it over to Zoe. 
Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you so much for having me and thanks to Unak for the invitation. Um, so as Joe mentioned, I'm a journalist with People's Dispatch and I've been focused on covering people's movements and people's organizations within Latin America over the past couple of years. Um, and in this, this time, I've been able to report a lot uh, extensively on Venezuela, uh, on the Bolivarian Revolution and the movements that build and have sustained the Bolivarian Revolution over these past two decades. Um, so in my time, I wanted to focus on talking about why it's important to defend this project um, and give kind of a little bit of more an explanation about what is being done in Venezuela, what's happening on the ground, what are people's movements uh, doing, what are they organizing around and what are they fighting to maintain? Um, because I think, you know, from hearing from Vijay and Margaret, I think it's interesting to point out that it was really a resounding victory of the PSUV uh, ratifying um, this government that has been in, you know, this party that's been uh, in power for the past couple of decades, because it is the party that is bringing forward the Bolivarian Revolution, which we can also call the Bolivarian Project. So why are people supporting this project? What does it mean to the people? Um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, so as many of us know, uh, this time of pandemic has been very revealing um, in terms of showing the true nature of our enemies, showing where their interests really lie. Of course, in the United States, we've seen complete state abandonment. We've seen, you know, breadcrumbs being offered to the working class of the United States amid one of the most severe public health crises, severe economic crises. But on the other hand, we've also seen glimmers of hope across the world. Um, we've seen governments and projects um, that have been in the time of the pandemic have really shown in terms of showing the humanitarian character, the humanist and the people centered character of these um, projects. So I think, of course, we can point to Cuba that despite being, you know, one of the most attacked and blockaded nations in the world for the past 60 years, a very small island has been able, you know, was stood out and during the pandemic in terms of providing medical resources, providing doctors, teams of uh, medical workers to, gov uh, to countries, you know, from Italy to a lot of countries in Africa. I mean, they've really been a true example of what it, this humanitarian project looks like. Um, Venezuela is another example of this. Um, we don't see it as much on the global level, but you know, being on the ground there and for the past couple of months speaking to people within Venezuela, I mean, the way that the government has handled the pandemic, despite the regime of sanctions, um, the complete, you know, the, as, and some will refer to it as unilateral coercive measures that have been applied on the country for the past couple of years, which have, you know, had catastrophic impacts on the government's ability to buy and import food, to buy and import medicine. Of course, the purchasing power has been completely um, devastated. Yet, in spite of all these conditions, in spite of all these adversities, Venezuela has been able to completely control the rate of infection in, in the country. Um, the mortality rate is one of the lowest in the world. Um, and this is really due to the Bolivarian Revolution and the Bolivarian Project, because throughout the past year now, it's almost been, um, it has been the people's movements, the community-based organizations, the local committees in every single neighborhood that have been carrying out food distribution, that have been working with the local medical clinics, which are often staffed by Cuban trained doctors or even Cuban doctors themselves, to be able to do the house to house visits, um, to do broad amounts of testing. Um, they were able to create campaign hospitals where people who were infected with the virus were able to stay there. It's also, um, I don't, many might know of the program called CLAP, which is the local distribution committees. So these provide boxes of food once a month um, to uh, families across the country. Um, and so it's all of these initiatives um, that have been able to, you know, in a time of a pandemic that have been able to keep this infection rate to such a low um, level despite all of these adverse conditions. So I think just to start out with that, it's really important to keep in mind that even though one of the countries that has, you know, in a severe economic crisis that is severely impacted by these sanctions has still been able to care for the people, 
to take into account the people and their survival and to put them first above all. Um, and so I think the question is, how is Venezuela able to do this? As I already mentioned, they're having, of course, you know, severe economic blockade, um, very adverse conditions. However, it is also, you know, it's 20 years out of the creation of the Bolivarian Revolution and the Bolivarian Project, which we be began with the election of Hugo Chavez in, in the late 1990s, and then the writing of the Bolivarian Constitution in 1999. And so I think when we think about what does this project mean, it's about creating uh, people-centered and participatory uh, institutions. It is about the transfer of power and decision-making power to communities. Um, and it is about using the economic and resource wealth in Venezuela. Of course, Venezuela has one of the largest oil reserves in the world. Um, to support the development and advancement of people in education, in healthcare, in public infrastructure, and in job creation overall. Um, so in order to kind of highlight this point, I just wanted to talk about a couple of experiences that I've had as a journalist who's been able to talk to people's movements, who's been able to talk to leaders in Venezuela who are building these projects on the ground. Um, so as some of the other speakers mentioned, I was also uh, in Venezuela during the elections. Um, I was not there as a um, official election observer. I was there as just a journalist covering what was happening. Um, so I was able to actually spend election day and the election night before, or the pre-election night um, with the leader Mariela Machado, who is from the camp encampment called Kaikashi. Um, and she is a leader from the movement, the, in Spanish it's El Movimiento de Pobladores y Pobladoras, which means a settlers movement. Um, and she organized her community in La Vega, the parish of La Vega three years back to occupy, or four years back to occupy a plot of lands in the city that was not being used um, in a productive way. They occupied this land and they demanded that the government um, expropriate it from the former company that owned the, that the, from the company that owned this land and demanded that the government give it to the community and give them resources to build their own houses. This is a group of families who lived in poor neighborhoods, who didn't have uh, access to decent housing, who didn't have conditions to be living in a dignified way. And so they do this action of taking over this land. Uh, the land is given to them by the government um, in I don't know what, I would have to double check right now what year this um, constitutional amendment was passed, but there is, um, an al um, in the constitution, it allows for unoccupied land or unproductive land to be transferred uh, in the, if the communities make a case for uh, them needing it to uh, develop their community. So in this case, they use a government, you know, a law that was a product of people's mobilizations um, to demand this land, they were given resources and the community themselves built houses. They built um, a housing complex, they built a community radio station, they built a community kitchen. They also have um, a kind of a multimedia room where kids can use computers. And so this is just one of the uh, really impressive examples of how what communities have been doing and how they do this in coordination with the state and in advancing the Bolivarian process. And uh, Mariela was actually standing for the uh, supplant, uh, the, stand, the second option of the candidacy for the, as a representative in the National Assembly. And she was passed. So she is going to be part of that National Assembly and part of building, you know, the next le the new legislation to support housing communities like hers to support the right to dignified housing within the city. Um, so this is one really important example. And then the next one, I just wanted to talk about the general commune project. So communities like Kaikashi are also part of a whole initiative by organized communities, by grassroots communities to organize in all of the uh, levels possible. So as we know, we're no longer in the stage of capitalism where workers are meeting in the factory. Um, it is mostly on, in the territory, in their neighborhoods, in their communities, 
where people are able to share together, build together, and you know, demand what they want in the future. So in Venezuela, neighborhoods and communities are organized into communal councils. Uh, people come together, they create communal councils where they're able to distribute resources from the state in the way that they see fit. And so this is the, the communal process is something that was a, a vision of the Bolivarian revolution since its inception, but it has been kind of a, a focus of building uh, in the past couple of years as the blockade has intensified and as people have seen that it's necessary that on all levels people are organized and people are able to create conditions for all people in Venezuela. And so in the communes, uh, we see many uh, examples of this. There are urban communes that are organized to create uh, community clinics that receive resources from the state and have created, you know, um, pharmacies where people can come and have more access to medicine. There's of course, there's rural communes where people collectivize agricultural production and distribute to the community. And so I think these are very important examples and I invite you to read people's dispatch, to read other anti-imperialist uh, people focused media projects to learn more about this because these are the projects that we must be defending. When we're defending Venezuela, we're also defending a model of a new society and a new world. And so I just wanted to bring a couple of these examples to kind of illustrate what is Venezuela, what is the Bolivarian Revolution, and what is important to be defending. So thank you so much. Thank you, Zoe. Our final speaker is um, Bamin Azad. Dr. Bamin Azad is um, the executive director of the US Peace Council. He represents the World Peace Council at the United Nations. He is the coordinator of the No Bases Coalition, um, does a lot of other political work, and he's also a member of uh, the UNAC Administrative Committee. So we'll turn it over to Bamin. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for participating. <clears throat> well, it seems to me that all that needed to be said uh, has been said already by previous speakers. So I would focus on, instead of going into details of the elections and all that, I would like to move on to the theme of the threat of United States imperialism against uh, Venezuela. One aspect of it, uh, Vijay very elaborately talked about the sanctions, which my fear is that there's not gonna be a let up on that by the United States until um, something extraordinary happens in Venezuela, which I doubt. <clears throat> but anyway, um, we went to five, six different electoral centers uh, during the day in Caracas. Um, it was reported that about the average participation was about 30, 31% or 32. And a lot of people were asking upon my return that why was the turnout so low? Um, I asked that question from officials and, and authorities of the, the government. And they said that this is the normal average for parliamentary elections in Venezuela. And, you know, when you look at it in terms of inside the United States also, um, the average participation for congressional elections and midterm elections is far lower than the normal presidential elections. So this should not be um, kind of a surprise for us or lack of support for the government especially if we say 30%, uh, my experience there shows that uh, that 31% is an average. It's not just the same everywhere. Uh, we could see that enthusiasm of the people for voting in most of the regions, areas, communities that were pro-revolution, pro-Bolivarian revolution, pro-government. Actually, there were long, long lines in some of those areas and enthusiastic people were waiting to vote and interesting a lot of elderly people in the very hot sun uh, were in line patiently um, to to make the vote give the vote and and also <clears throat> they were chanting 
every once in a while you could see that the whole line of people waiting would start chanting revolutionary slogans and, and things like that. So enthusiasm was there all the way. And I think that was a sign that the US efforts to, through sanctions, through pressures with the, on the government, economic hardships and COVID um, limitations has not really reduced the enthusiasm of the people in their support for their legitimate government. I was happy, very happy to see that. But I, I would like to say that regardless of that enthusiasm that was there and would, could be seen, this 31% probably is gonna be again used by US government to claim that majority have not voted and this and that, and they will continue and probably they will intensify their sanctions. And I expect that to happen because their previous efforts in terms of sabotages, blockades, cutting off the electricity, economic sanctions, um, even trying to invade, um, none of that has worked. And the last effort to really bring people to their knees and disappoint them from their situation has not worked either in this election proved it. So I expect that, that the method of sanctions will be intensified um, and every other venue for Venezuela to get some relief from these pressures will be, will be closed, blocked. So it is up to us. We should not say that, okay, since they have now 67, 70% majority in the National Assembly and they have the executive branch in their hand, uh, that now we are safe. We are not safe. They are not safe. And we should not uh, let down our guards. We should really intensify our efforts to push the new administration in the United States to recognize the legitimacy of Venezuelan government, to negotiate open talks, dialogue, as it was suggested by the Venezuelan government, uh, without any preconditions with the Venezuelan government, and try to come to a diplomatic solution uh, to deal with the reality of Venezuelan revolution instead of denying it and trying to suppress it. So that would be my, my two cents at the end. And I hope that we in the Peace Council the peace movement, we do not think that that strong victory of the Venezuelan uh, Bolivarian revolution in this last election would relieve us of the serious responsibility that we have towards uh, protecting and defending the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you, Bayman. Just my own comment on the um, voter turnout, which is a question that people have been asking. Um, in the midterm, last midterm elections in 2018 in the United States, it was 50% of the registered voters who voted. That's the highest it's been in many, many decades. The average in the United States has been around 35%. And that's out of a, a population, um, a registered population of about 57% of the um, voting age people in the country very low registration compared to 90%, 95% in Venezuela. So when you talk about 31%, um, uh, you're talking about 31 of a very large percentage of the population. And in the United States, when you talk about 35%, you're talking about 35% of only about 50%, 57% of the population. So you can't really um, compare them in, in those ways. Um, and I'm sure the United States would have uh, um, spoken out against these uh, elections, condemned these elections, whether there was a high turnout or a low turnout. Um, so let me ask a question and anybody and all of you can answer. Um, uh, the first one I have is from Ann Wright. Um, and she asked, um, she said that CNN has been um, putting up images of hospitals in um, Caracas that uh, show dirty hospitals and bad uh, conditions for the patients. She asked if anybody had the opportunity to see any of the hospitals and anybody have any comment on that, um, that particular um, aspect. Is there anybody that can comment on that? Margaret? I mean. I don't know if Zoe's had a chance to visit the hospitals uh, while you're there, but um, one of the people who was there observing actually uh, tested positive 
we were all tested for free uh, a couple of days before we needed to fly out. And, um, and this person tested positive and so was uh, discreetly told about the results, brought back to the hotel room and, and reassured that they would be there with her and that she could stay as long as she needed to and they would provide food. And uh, because of an underlying medical condition, they did decide a day or so later to admit her to the hospital. And so I've been in touch with her pretty closely and interviewed her for an article that should be coming out on Truth Out this week. And, uh, and she said that she feels so lucky that this happened to her in Venezuela, uh, that she had excellent care at the hospital, excellent attention. Um, they discharged her with you know, the, all the medications that she needed. They've continued to stay in touch with her. She was in the hospital for six days and she had nothing but praise for the healthcare system there and said that you know, it was, she was felt lucky that if it had to happen, it happened in Venezuela because in Puerto Rico, where she's from, there's such a, uh, you know, there's been such an a, a attack on the country, economic attack there as well, and devastation, and um, and she doesn't have health insurance. So, you know, it would have been a very different scenario if she had had this happen at home. So, I mean, I can, so that's all I can say. And then, you know, as Zoe said, their numbers are really good. And when you look at the numbers of cases per million, they're neck and neck with Guyana, which is the other country in South America that's managing this well. But you look at all the, all the other countries and they're like 20 to 30 times as many cases based on population as there are in Venezuela. Uh, or maybe not, I think it's seven to nine as many cases, but 20 to 30 times as many deaths as there are in Venezuela. So um, I think that speaks for itself. And I also uh, been in touch with her and she told me that she is under supervision of two doctors and both doctors are Cuban. I think one, one of the things that I saw when I was in Venezuela, which was a year and a half ago perhaps, was first of all, they were really lacking in, in medicines because the um, sanctions are depriving them of medicines. They're not allowing medicines to come in. Even during this pandemic, they've toughened sanctions rather than um, uh, expressed solidarity and allowed things to come in. When I left, I had some medication that I take. And one of the people that was um, uh, showing us around in Venezuela asked if I could leave it when I left because his wife had a condition which needed that medication and she was unable to get it. So it's one of the ways that, that they're strangling uh, Venezuela. And uh, then they say, see the medicine medications are not good and so forth. So if I could just follow up on that, they had a thriving pharmaceutical sector in Venezuela. They were producing most of the medicines for their country. And because they can't import the precursors and because of the capital flight of investment fleeing from Venezuela, they do have an 85% shortage of pharmaceuticals in that country now. It's devastated their pharmaceutical sector. And that's what the economic war does. And caused a lot of deaths. Um, th there was another question about the housing. Um, the the uh, government has provided housing for um, people that needed housing, um, uh, lacked it. Um, uh, someone asked if anybody has seen any of that, how, how that um, looks, is that, are those good housing and, and, and so forth. Is there anybody that has any information about that? Vijay, I think you've also been to some of the housing projects, but I'll just comment quickly that uh, the housing mission is called uh, is one of the great missions, which are these projects that are undertaken by the government to address social uh, demands. So, for example, there's a there's a housing mission. There's also Mission Barrio Adentro, which is about creating community health clinics in different neighborhoods, and the housing mission, as of I want to say a couple of weeks ago, it uh, passed one one of the um, the landmark goals, which was over three million houses uh, constructed. Um, and so I think this is a huge victory. I visited uh, one of these housing complexes. I mean, you couldn't really imagine this kind of thing happening in the United States, of course. But um, you know, decent conditions. Uh, people with access to what they need, but I think above all, just decent housing and housing. I mean, in Latin American cities, there's a lot of flight from the countryside because of the conditions imposed by neoliberal trade policies, inability to live in the countryside. And so a lot of 
neighborhoods are built in, especially in the mountainous cities, are built in you know unsafe uh, areas. They're built with uh, cardboard, with tin, and so these housing missions have really addressed that structural issue that you see across cities in Latin America, which don't haven't had similar responses. There was a question on: Does anybody know on about the relationship of Canada with? Um, uh, with Venezuela? Has it played a similar role as the United States or a, a different role? Oh, uh, no, Joe, that's not exactly the formulation. It's neither similar nor different. Canada has been the lead gangster against Venezuela since 1998. 60%, please mark this, 60% of the world's mining companies are headquartered in Canada, 60%. At Tricontinental, we did a report on the 10 worst Canadian mining companies. You can find it on our website. 60% of them are headquartered in Canada. Um, when Hugo Chavez was the legitimate president of, um, of Venezuela, uh, a man by the name of Mr. Monk, uh, the head of Barrick Gold, one of the true gangsters of the Americas, um, wrote an article in a newspaper in Toronto calling Hugo Chavez a dictator, an authoritarian, and I do believe Mr. Monk used the word thug, that racist term which is wielded by northern mining magnates and politicians, even liberal politicians against southern politicians. Um, why did he call Hugo Chavez a, a dictator or authoritarian? Because Hugo Chavez decided audaciously that the minerals and resources and wealth of Venezuela must be utilized to build homes, as Zoe talked about, to build a pharmaceutical sector, as Margaret talked about, to build the life of the people of Venezuela and not to enrich Canadian bondholders, Canadian mining company magnates, et cetera. That was the audacity. That's the true audacity of hope, Mr. Obama. That's the true audacity of hope. Hugo Chavez was more audacious than you, Barack, because he decided that his people should come before profit. And the Canadian government has been the leading force in the Lima Group, which was set up, unfortunately named the Lima Group, Joe. That's unfortunate. It should be known as the Ottawa Group because their first meeting was in Lima, Peru. That's true. That's why the name is Lima Group. It's a group of countries run by oligarchic right-wing governments that are pledged unitedly to break the UN Charter and overthrow the government in Venezuela and to roll back the Bolivarian Revolution. That's the express purpose that they've created this racket. It's racketeering, it's international racketeering. They have created an illegal racket that attempts to subvert the UN Charter of 1945. And the leader in this is none other, none other than Mr. Justin Trudeau for all that putative liberalism and all his boyish charm. He is operating as the lead executive of the mining conglomerates of Northern America who want to get their fingers into Venezuela, not for the oil, but for everything else, rare earth minerals, uranium, and so on. And the government of the Bolivarian Revolution, just as the government first of Evo Morales and now Lucho Arce of Mas in Bolivia, are refusing to allow these companies to come in and behave as they do in other countries in Latin America, like Colombia, where Ivan Duque, who operates on behalf of mining companies, is quite happy to see social movement leaders killed every day. He's quite pleased with that, doesn't do anything to protect his own people. He is, in fact, the president, not of Colombia, but the president of the mining companies, whereas Ivo Morales, uh, Mr. Arce, Mr. Maduro, they are the presidents of their people. And so Canada is first among you know, the lot. It's in, in fact, at times ahead of the United States in this barbaric way that it operates in the Americas. So you know, I, I'm just saying people, go and look at the Lima group, but don't be mistaken by the name. It's the Ottawa group. And I just want to point this out that we just co-edited a book called Vivi Ramos, Venezuela versus Hybrid War uh, with Claudia de la Cruz and Manolo de los Santos. The book is widely available, but in it, we cover all this stuff. You know, We cover the way in which they have prosecuted a hybrid war 
utilizing instruments like the so-called Lima Group, Canada and its mining companies in the lead, and the United States once more, the US government once more, not operating on behalf of human rights. So the kind of verbiage you'll hear from Mike Pompeo, I mean, my God, to believe Mike Pompeo is somehow the arbiter of human rights is extraordinary. You've lost your mind if you think that he is somehow the oracle of human rights. Mike Pompeo is basically doing the dirty work of big corporations. They want to get their grubby little paws into Venezuela and the Bolivarian revolution is fighting them off. And that's really what this is about, guys. This is not about elections, human rights, you know, nothing. It's about, they want to go in there. They want the uranium. They want the rare earth min minerals. That's what it's about. There's a question of why the Venezuelan government doesn't arrest Guaido. Does anybody want to comment on that? I mean, I think any of us could, could answer that. Um, I think it's a it's a brilliant move on the Venezuelan government uh, because if they did arrest him, it would give the United States another excuse, you know, to try to do some sort of military maneuver or delegitimize the government of President Maduro. And you know, in Gua in Venezuela, Guaido is really a clown. I mean, I remember uh, people make fun of him. They call him names. You know, he calls these massive rallies and then like nobody shows up or, you know, maybe a couple of well-dressed people show up. So, you know, they didn't really have to arrest him. They just, he's ineffective, he's powerless and, and he's just demonstrated that over and over again. And in fact, it's not that they not only arrest him, they are actually protecting him. They told me that, that we have to protect him. To, to make sure that nothing happens to them. <laughs> That's what they're doing. You know, it, it was interesting. When I was in Venezuela, um, I went to an opposition rally um, and I got off the subway, which was for free. And um, I saw a ton of police. Uh, this rally was called by Guaido, and, but I didn't see any people. Uh, the first thing I saw was that the police in the front lines were women, women police. And so I asked why are the women the ones that are in the front lines of the police lines? And they said, well, they are better at um, uh, diminishing the conflict, um, pushing down the conflict. So they saw their role there as to stop conflict and to, um, uh, you know, uh, help this thing happen in the way it was going to happen. But nobody really showed up. And they were supposed to march to the National Assembly. So we went to the National Assembly, and there was a small crowd, less than 100 people, well-dressed. Um, and people started coming around, and uh, they, were, they weren't hostile, like they were going to attack them or something, but they were um, asking them questions. They were talking to them in an animated way. And then all of a sudden, um, these motorcycles and motorbikes came. And I mean, thousands of them came down the street and they surrounded and kept on going around the National Assembly building. And apparently those were um, supporters of Maduro because they had heard that this supposed Guaido March was going to kind of take over the assembly building, but it never really materialized. And when these motorcyclists came down, they were very peaceful and they didn't try to do anything, but the police brought all the Guaido supporters behind the police line to keep them separated. So they really protected them. And I think they're doing that same thing with Guaido. And I think it, it shows um, that they are allowing um, even though he's done things that should be considered, calling for a coup, calling for his country to be um, invaded by the United States, that in any other country you'd be arrested for that. But uh, they're allowing this because uh, they think that's the best way to build the Bolivarian revolution in the process. And I think that's the real answer. There's been a couple of questions about the United Nations. Does Venezuela have much support in the United Nations? Why doesn't the United Nations condemn the unilateral sanctions? Does anybody want to answer that? Uh, I could do that, please, if you don't mind. I just want to remind people that every year, 
every year, punctually, the United Nations General Assembly votes on a resolution. This last year, it was 186 to, I think, three or four. Punctually, the United Nations General Assembly votes to condemn the US imposed blockade on Cuba every single year, every year. 186 was the count last year to three or four on the side of the United States government. Um, if there were a vote on the blockade on Venezuela, the numbers would be identical. Uh, I, I can guarantee you they would be identical because of the way that the resolutions would have to be worded. Every single UN special rapporteur, every one of them, from the rapporteur on cruel and uh, illegal sanctions to the rapporteur on housings to the rapporteur on food to the rapporteur on every single UN rap special rapporteur has condemned the sanctions policy that the United States is unilaterally and criminally imposing on Venezuela. Again, in our book, we go over this, every single special rapporteur. But the United States is a illegal, uh, pursues an illegal policy, doesn't care about it. I'd like you to consider something. In 2003, the United States imposed an illegal war on Iraq. Now, the word illegal is not used loosely. There was no UN resolution for that war. You remember Colin Powell went and lied to the Security Council about weapons of mass destruction. George Tenet sat right behind him. They, as Colonel Larry Wilkerson informed us, they slipped Colin Powell information, which he could not verify. Had to, he had to present things he didn't know about. It's a great scandal. Shame on the United States for that. The next year in 2004, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan told a BBC interview that the war that the United States pursued in Iraq was illegal. You know, when things are illegal, there should be consequences. There's never been consequences for the United States to pursue the illegal war in Iraq. The United States does not fear breaking international law. It doesn't fear it because there are no consequences ever. So it has been routinely since 1998, flagrantly violating international law with its policy on Venezuela, routinely snubs the UN General Assembly position on Cuba. And because friends, because there are no consequences for the UN actions, it just continues to do this stuff. And because the lesser evils that come and then take power in Washington, like Barack Obama, please go and read his book, Promised Land. It is a terrifying account of how liberalism, when it comes into the White House, totally surrenders to imperialism and power. Mr. Barack Obama, who was opposed to the death penalty, used to go and sign essentially warrants to kill people by drone attack. It was called a kill list. In his memoir, he writes that the reason he did this allowed hundreds of people to be killed by the US military illegally without a trial, they were illegal assassinations. He says, because my chief of staff felt that a democratic president, a liberal president must not look soft on ter terrorism, must not look soft on terrorism. In other words, liberal politicians in the United States don't want the appearance of looking weak. So they will therefore go full steam ahead and break international law. And I'm telling you, this is what Joe Biden is going to do. Please don't have any illusions about the Biden presidency. They may come in and they may say, okay, we'll talk, no preconditions, whatever. These people don't care about international law and the public in the United States has not held them to account and the world simply doesn't have the power to hold them to account. Now, until the US population holds their representatives to account for violating generation after generation international law, nothing is going to change. So I just want, that's why I said earlier, please call representatives like Cory Bush and you know Karen Bass and others and ask them to walk into the United States Congress and put a resolution forward condemning the US sanctions policy in over 30 countries. If these people don't do it, what's the point of you know, electing the squad and these sort of democratic socialist candidates and so on? What's the point of electing them in? What's the point of this discourse of, you know, let's put in Biden because at least we can push him. You don't even try to push them. When Obama came in, a lot of people just said, well, he'll do the right thing. They don't, friends. They simply don't. Thank you. There's been a couple of questions on sanctions. Uh, first of all, about the gas. Again, when I was there, um, 
uh, in 2019, you could drive into a gas station, fill up your car with gas and drive out. Didn't cost you any money. Uh, but I understand there's a big problem with gas now for cars and for uh, cooking. Can any, and the other part of that is just generally on sanctions. I, I understand that they're very tough and very severe and causing severe economic problems in um, Venezuela. Do you think Venezuela can survive under these sanctions? So anybody and everybody is welcome to answer that, those questions. I mean, I could start and others certainly will add on to it, but you know, it, it's very different this year, you know, from, cause I was there with you, Joe, in, in March of 2019. And now they do have a, a serious shortage of fuel and very long lines. People are waiting two to four days to get, you know, full tank of gas for their car. And this is in a country that has, you know, the number one oil reserves in the world but they have a very thick type of oil that needs a diluent in order to be refined in their refineries. And, and I understand they used to refine a lot of it, you know, using Sitco up in, in Texas, but now, you know, they can't get the parts to keep those refineries working. They can't get the diluent to, to put into there. And so it is really crippling, you know, their fuel. I understand that there are 10 tankers coming from Iran right now. Earlier in the year, there were five tankers from Iran that made it through, despite the fact that the US Navy has a presence down there around Venezuelan waters. We'll see what happens with these you know, 10 tankers that are coming. Uh, to, and, and the last time they also brought um, uh, parts and things to get the refineries running. I think it's the fortunate thing is that Venezuela does have relationships with countries like Russia and China and Iran who try to provide some relief for this, you know, this economic war and are willing to go against the United States and defy the, the US imposed coercive economic measures. Um, but it it's, you know, it is taking a toll. And one of the reasons, and I talked to one person there who said he thought part of the reason that folks were not coming out for the elections is that they're out chopping wood so they can have wood to cook their food. You know, it's 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 really a struggle for folks. Sorry. Any other comments? You, we should not put the question in this passive way. The question is, will we allow for Venezuela to be suffocated like that? I think it's on our shoulder. When we ask that question, we should ask, are we going to allow that to happen? And that puts the responsibility on our shoulder. I think we have to put it in this formulation that what can we do to stop this madness? rather than whether, of course, if it drags on for too long, no country will survive. But we shouldn't let it get to that point. So it's our responsibility. We have to organize even more and do more to stop that. I'd encourage people to go to the sanctionskill.org website and get involved in that um, campaign. Um, that is really our obligation, being in the belly of the beast here. Um, let me end with the question of, uh, that all of you are welcome to answer, is are you optimistic about the future for Venezuela? This is one that was asked. Um, I'll just say something quickly. Um, I am extremely optimistic about the future in Venezuela because having met with and you know, met with different people from different areas of the country, different organizations, they're hopeful about the future. They know that they're fighting one of, you know, the world's strongest military power that, you know, has made horrible threats to their sovereignty, has threatened military intervention. However, they continue every day to fight for a better future, to deepen the project of building the revolution organizing the communities, trying to, you know, create basic conditions for survival in every way possible, using creative methods. I think we can see a lot of, you know, Cuba in the surviving of the special period, you know, using all means necessary to support communities, to support the most vulnerable who are most impacted by these sanctions um, and coming together in new ways that maybe weren't possible before. Um, I spoke to Hernan Vargas, who is a militant and leader from the, uh, Movimiento de Pobladores, and he said that in these times of crisis, 
is when socialism is most built. It is not in times of abundance and in times of where it's comfortable, but it's right now when people start, when people are intensifying the links of solidarity and working even harder to create a better future. So I think we have to have hope because they have hope. And if we don't have hope, then what are we fighting for? Thank you. Any other comments on that? I would add that I'm similarly optimistic. I'm so impressed with the Venezuelan people with their level of political sophistication and their understanding of US imperialism. And they don't get fooled by these tactics that the United States uses. And in addition, one structure we haven't mentioned is a civilian militia that they've created millions of Venezuelans that have joined the civilian militia to defend their country against the United States. And that was started after President Trump was elected and was making such you know, threats to them. We in the United States have a lot to learn from our brothers and sisters in Venezuela. And I think international solidarity is fundamental, not just you know, our responsibility as people who live in, a, in an empire to impact our government and stop the destructive practices that it's doing, but those practices are also being used against people in the United States. These economic war, you know, there's no reason why in the U.S. we don't have health care and affordable housing and and free school and all the things that sophisticated, you know, civilized countries provide for their for their people. And so we have a lot to learn from the from the Venezuelans as well about struggle and about building you know, a country that does put people before a profit. So I'm optimistic and I think that, you know, we should understand how intimately our future is connected to the people of Venezuela. Right. Raymond, did you have something to say? No, I just wanted to say we are under sanctions too. Yes. Who, who is we, you mean? You're right, in the US. <laughs> yes. That economic sanctions work in the same way on us. And uh, I mean, they are punishing the whole world. It's not just one nation or the other. They are, they are exploiting, oppressing, suppressing, destroying. That's what they are doing. And I think in this, it's not a question of will Venezuela survive? It's a question of will all of us survive in this situation? And, uh, any other last comments from anybody? Um, I would just like to say one thing, which is it's an honor to be here. Um, it's uh, very important that um, in the United States, within the United States, the anti-war peace movement grow, uh, develop, not remain isolated. Uh, this country requires a peace movement. Um, it is one of the most militarized countries in human history. It has an army that can destroy the whole planet in seconds. It is now creating hypersonic cruise missiles that are very, very dangerous space weapons that this administration has the bad taste to name their soldiers, the guardians, the <laughs> fascists from Margaret Atwood's Handmaid Tale. Um, it's a really problematic situation, friends. We can't be isolated. We can't feel somehow, you know, sad and, and uh, stay within our small pockets. You have to reach out to the broad masses of people and generate a mass peace movement, a mass anti-war movement. The world requires it. Um, the world really requires it. It's not just Venezuela. It's Cuba. It's Iran. It's China. I mean, this country could go to war against anybody in a heartbeat. It can destroy the world in a second. It's up to you to stop them. Yes. yes. Well, that's why we're doing all the work that we do. Um, I'd urge you to go to the UNAC website, which is unacpeace.org. Um, get on our email list um, and um, have your organization join UNAC. We are an attempt to bring together all the peace groups in the country. Um, the US is the most um, militarized country that the world has ever seen. We have troops in about 172 countries. We have about 20 times the number of foreign military bases as all other countries in the world combined. And I think during this pandemic, we, we have seen an increased consciousness of people around the world, seeing the way countries like the United States have handled this pandemic compared to countries like China. Um, that has basically been able to stave it off um, and not have a, a growth um, of, uh, 
of this, or even countries like Cuba and Venezuela that can't get, that have blockades against um, them, can't get some basic needs for their people, can't get medicines in the case of Venezuela. Um, they are doing better in numbers because there is a, a overall government effort. So I think there's a consciousness that has been raised and we in the United States need to build an anti-war movement that can really stay the hand of our government because that is really the evil empire um, in this world. So I'd like to thank the um, speakers for their participation. I'd like to thank everybody that listened in um, on the UNAC website, which is in, in the um, uh, chat, is unacpeace.org. There will also be the video of this um, uh, uh, webinar. And thank you for joining us all. Good night. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Great to be with everyone. Thank you so much.